but I'm going to start with, with some preliminaries, some discussions of historical linguistics methodology in general, uh, and I will review very quickly the major sound, uh, sorry, uh, the major language families of East Asia so that we can know, okay, well, we're going to talk about Sino-Tibetan, but what is its context in terms of other language families? And then I'll go through um, some branches of, of Sino-Tibetan, not all of them, but um, here we go. So language families of Asia, I've ordered them in uh, roughly speaking, I think the, the, uh, the history of their dispersal. So one thing that, that, that I'll be looking at is, is maps, where um, if a language is quite isolated in its geography or, or broken up in its geography, it probably spread earlier. Uh, and that's, uh, you know, that's, this is the order that I came up with of uh, language families in, uh, in Asia according roughly to when they probably spread. So looking uh, first though at uh, modern nation states, and I'm only going to look at uh, the two Chinas, let's say. We have in Taiwan 20 languages, 15 of them Formosan and four Sinitic, which is say four Chinese dialects. And then in the PRC, 300 languages from 11 primary language families. That means like, you know, uh, like as different as Finnish and English or something like that. And if we compare that with Europe, in Europe there are 24 official languages used uh, in the context of the EU. And there's a total of about 130 languages spoken in, in, in this is not just in the EU, but in all of, kind of geographical Europe. And they uh, are found in four language families. So I think uh, it's just important contextually to realize that China has twice the linguistic diversity of Europe. So, so you know, uh, 300 languages, 11 families versus 130 languages and four language families. And I think that's, I don't know, I don't want to sort of belabor it necessarily, but I think that's very important contextually because, because if you look at how Europe is studied in academia, uh, and I don't know how Europe manifests politically, you would think Europe was more multilingual than China. Whereas in fact, China is much more multilingual than Europe. And uh, we can think about, you know, why that contradiction exists, uh, but maybe right, not right now. So looking at isolates, these are, you know, a single language that is, as far as we can tell, unrelated to any other language in the world. And we can look at their distribution and get a sense of like, I don't know, what the world would have been like a long time ago. So there's Ainu uh, spoken, uh, uh, or attested in three dialects, Sakhalin, Kuril, and Hokkaido. Uh, but uh, Sakhalin and Kuril are gone. Uh, Sakhalin survived into the 1970s, so there is some information about it, very little about Kuril. And, uh, and Hokkaido is kind of just barely around. Then Kusunda is uh, spoken in uh, Nepal, and there's, there were actually, um, at the beginning of the summer, there were two speakers, but there's only one speaker now. They were hunter-gatherer community that switched to, I don't know, uh, agriculture. Um, since the 1950s, and uh, are you know probably indicative of the of the the earliest linguistic uh, situation in that part of the world in in Nepal. Uh, and then Andamanese is spoken just in the Andaman Islands, and uh, is probably the most uh, robust of uh, spoken in in the Andaman Islands, uh, and um, uh, one island in particular. Uh, has is not uh, yet kind of interfered with by modern uh, civilization. So they are probably quite, uh, let's say, robust as far as language isolates go in terms of uh, maintenance of their language. Uh, then there's a language, Nihali, that is spoken in West Central India. Seems not to have been worked on very recently, but was still around in the 1990s and uh, has been highly influenced by Indo-Aryan and, and, and um, what they called, um, 
uh, Tamil, uh, what are those? Dravidian, Dravidian languages, um, but seems to be a language isolate. And then an interesting case, there's a language, uh, Veda, where currently it seems that uh, the, there is a population of, uh, uh, of let's say, an, an indigenous people who, uh, who, who traditionally used hunter-gathering as their subsistence strategy. And they speak now a kind of divergent dialect of Sinhalese. But it seems, uh, or, or, you know, I haven't looked into this at all, but um, they say this divergent dialect of Sinhalese has, you know, a substrate of uh, a language isolate that would have been the uh, indigenous language of Sri Lanka. So, oh, yes. And then, of course, uh, Burushaski uh, in northern Pakistan is also uh, considered uh, an isolate. So this gives you, I think, a nice impression of uh, basically in every direction, especially on islands, but to some extent in the mountains, uh, there's a language here or there that's unrelated to any other language in the world. And these are probably the, you know, the last remnants uh, of a diversity that's uh, kind of hard to imagine uh, that as other languages came and, and spread uh, to, um, to break up, uh, you know, these, uh, to, to leave these, these few isolates. And, and none of these are in China. As far as I know, there are, there are no isolates in China, which is kind of interesting in its own right. I'm not quite sure what it means. But now turning to Hmong Mian, I think this, uh, it, where it seems to me is in some ways the oldest, uh, if you like, a family of China. If you look at the map, uh, you see that it's, it's, it's very sparsely spread um, throughout China and, and uh, Vietnam, uh, Laos, and Thailand. And then uh, there's reason to think, uh, both based on known history and on um, the distribution of the branches, uh, that the, the, the people in Vietnam and Laos and whatnot uh, have moved south. And in general, I, that's a pattern that we will see again and again, that uh, languages are sort of spreading out of China and generally speaking, which has something to do with, you know, the world geography, languages are sort of coming in from the northwest and then pushing other languages out into the southeast. And uh, about Hmong Mian, there, so there are 39 uh, languages. They fall into two groups, Hmong and Mian. In Chinese, they're called Miao and Yao. Uh, they have very complex tonal systems. I wasn't sh sure, you know, just to what to say about these, these uh, going through a lot of languages very quickly. So I just to point out, you know, something to, so it's not just a list of names. Yeah, so you can say, oh, okay, Hmong Mian has very complex tonal systems. And Hmong Mian has very uh, long-term contact with uh, Chinese, such that uh, the, the, the Hmong in particular uh, all have a, a special place in uh, Chinese mythology, uh, where they're sort of the, the sister people to uh, the Chinese. And, um, and Hmong Mian languages are full of er very early Chinese loanwords. So they're very, uh, the study of Hmong Mian is very important to the study of Chinese historical phonology as well. Okay, now turning to Austroasiatic. Uh, uh, here again, looking at the map, you can see that probably it started in, uh, in China uh, with, for instance, this branch uh, Pakanic uh, still in China and is very widely spread out. So you see you have Munda and Kasi in India, and then uh, you have Nicobarese in the Nicobar Islands in the Southwest. Uh, but uh, the, the famous languages are, are Vietnamese and Khmer. So let's just go through that. There's 168 uh, Austroasiatic languages. The first attested is Mon, 
uh, which is uh, spoken in, in Mon State in Burma and in parts of Thailand. It was attested from the sixth century. And Vietnamese and Khmer are the two languages with official um, status at the national level. Yeah. Okay, now on to uh, th this family is called both Thai Kadai and Kradai. And again, if you look at the distribution, you see you know, these little enclaves up in China with Kra, very um, you know, dispersed. So this uh, suggests that the family comes from China and then spread uh, south. And uh, you notice that the colored blobs get sort of larger as you go south. Uh, and are are on uh, increasingly, or let's say, increasingly less diverse. So you have northern Thai, central Thai, and then southwestern Thai is the is the largest. And those are all you know varieties of Thai. Yeah? So uh, ninety five uh, Kradai languages, with the first attested being Thai, uh, which was written down in twelve eighty three, and is the only one of national status. The most famous. Uh, Kradai language in China is Zhuang, associated with the, the Zhuang ethnicity. So now on to Austronesian, uh, where I have to zoom way out because uh, these languages are spoken over a huge uh, geographic area. Uh, that includes, you see in the, in the lower left, Madagascar, all the way to Hawaii, uh, or something in the east. Uh, 1,257 languages. Uh, they all spread from uh, Formosa, and this is a kind of methodologically quite interesting because it can be hard sometimes to figure out where a language family spread from. You may know that there's a controversy about this for Indo-European languages. Uh, but in this case, it's easy because uh, the, uh, basically all of the primary branches of Austronesian are still present in Taiwan. But, uh, and then as you get sort of further and further from Taiwan, uh, you get um, uh, less divergence, less diversity. Um, and, and, um, just point out that uh, personally, I have trouble telling the difference between Austroasiatic and Austronesian, but the key is uh, Nisia is referring to islands like in Indonesia, you know, Malaysia, Micronesia. So this, uh, this language family is, is uh, very strongly associated with islands. It comes from Taiwan, got as far as Madagascar, uh, uh, and basically every island in the, in the Pacific would have been, um, would have been uh, Austronesian speaking at some point. Uh, and then in terms of national languages, Malay, Basa, Indonesia, Tagalog, and Malagasy are all um, Austronesian languages. And um, yeah, okay. So then now you know kind of the basic picture and what I'm not going to get into, uh, but uh, you should know is out there is kind of big uh, theories about relationships uh, between these groups. So like a lot of people in China think that Kradai is related to Sino-Tibetan. Uh, uh, and uh, Laurent Sagar thinks that Austronesian is related to Sino-Tibetan. A lot of people think that Kradai is related to Austronesian. And, and here's how I look at these things kind of in, from sort of first principles. On the one hand, uh, language as a technology was probably not invented a lot of times independently. So ultimately, all languages on Earth are probably related, and um, languages will tend to be related to languages that are close by. So at some point, for instance, the Austronesian family would have had to have gotten from the mainland to Taiwan. So, so kind of prima facie, it is related to Austroasiatic, but uh, this is the kind of thing that it's not going to be very profitable to work on because uh, none of these languages are particularly well studied by European by European standards, uh, and um, 
and uh, you know something like Indo-European. Let's talk about uh, in terms of big families. Indo-Uralic looks quite promising, uh, but is extremely hard uh, to figure out and is very controversial. And that, despite both Indo-European and Uralic having 200 years of research done on them uh, at, at a very high level with a lot of primary evidence. So I think it's premature to worry about relationships among the language families of Asia until um, the work on the individual language families is uh, more advanced. And now some uh, remarks about uh, historical linguistics. So the key method in historical linguistics is the comparative method. Uh, and the other thing to keep in mind is analogy. And the way I think about this is, so, so you have regular phonology and you have analogy. And we'll, uh, we'll, we'll, we'll look at them in turn. And then I also want to just mention this, uh, I don't know what to call it, it's not quite a methodology, but a, uh, a way of, of looking at human prehistory, let's put it that way, uh, which is called Werte und Sachen uh, in German. Uh, we always say it in English, in German. Uh, words and things, where basically if you can reconstruct words in a proto-language, it means that there was some group of people who spoke that language and had those words, uh, and that means uh, mentions of uh, technologies, practices, animals uh, are also reconstructable, right? It's, it's, it's a way of accessing the, the physical and social world of a prehistoric community through its language. Uh, but I will get uh, back to that. So looking at the comparative method, uh, and for some of you this will be totally old hat, uh, but maybe for some a little bit uh, uh, less so. So we notice systematic correspondences between words in languages. And just to kind of keep it easy, and hopefully uh, languages some of us at least are familiar with, I look at uh, Latin, Sanskrit, English, and German. So you notice that where Latin has a P, Sanskrit has a P, uh, but English doesn't have a P. It has an F, and German also has an F. You can ignore the fact that German uses two letters for the F sound. That's, that's uh, just an issue of spelling. So that's for the word for father. Uh, it also holds for the word for fish and uh, for the word for foot. Now, when we find a pattern like this, uh, we, we uh, let's say, you, you might think, oh, well, it either it holds sometimes, it doesn't hold sometimes. But the methodological principle is that a pattern like this needs to hold all the time. And then either, if you find exceptions, either they're phonetically conditioned or they're evidence of loan words. Uh, so, so having seen a pattern like this, then you can think uh, these languages at one time in the distant past must have been the same language which gradually ch changed into these four languages. And in these words, in this position, either it had a P or it had an F. Now, how to decide uh, which it was? Um, I'll just point out that uh, Latin and Sanskrit are, are not particularly close geographically. And English and German are closer, especially when we know that, you know, some historical facts like that English was brought to uh, England from, uh, from, let's say, the German-speaking world uh, in the 5th and 6th century. So that's ju just purely that sort of geographical and historical context makes you think probably the P is original and the Germanic languages changed the P to an F. Uh, but uh, also uh, we can have recourse to linguistic typology, uh, which is that we've, we see again and again languages that change P's into F's. So like Japanese changed P into F, uh, Greek changed P into F. So, so if you just had to guess which one's older, the P or the F, you would guess the P. Yeah? So, so that's what we would say here. And uh, we can say that the the language Indo-European that later became all four of these languages 
had a P in these words, and then that changed to an F in English and German. So that's the comparative method. You, you, you bring words together, you find the patterns. For each pattern, you come up with an explanation, and that way you can reconstruct how the, the words used to be pronounced. I'm not going to go into uh, you know, the reconstruction of these particular words, because that would be a lecture about Indo-European and not about Simon Spen. Um, yeah, I've already mentioned that. OK. So now on to analogy. But maybe what I should say is that uh, the, the, all of this stuff, his regular historical phonology, is a process that affects inherited vocabulary uh, where the, 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 let's say, I would say, the psychological process in question is memory, right? You, you learn something from your parents, and then you speak it when you speak the language. So you're correctly remembering the, wor remembering the word, and then just uh, natural phonetic tendencies when populations are no longer in contact allows uh, a sound to gradually change into another sound through, it, through you can think of it as errors of production or, um, or perception. So, you know, someone, someone, because of the way the lips works, someone occasionally pronounces a P as an F, and then maybe the child learns it as an F. I mean, I'm radically oversimplifying, but the, 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 perp, the point I want to make is phonological change of this kind is indicative of correctly remembering the language as it was sort of, I mean, taught to you is not quite the word, but as you, as you learned. It. Whereas analogy is about uh, what happens when you forget something. So, um, so here, uh, and I think this is, uh, this notation is something that I, I would sort of like everyone to uh, come away with, where uh, you, this is how you do four-part analogy, it's called. Not all analogy is four-part analogy, but it's always worth trying to see whether you can make an analogy in the form of four-part analogy. And why is it called for part? Well, you see there are four things here, yeah? So the way you read it is talk is to talk as help is to X. And um, I wonder, can I have any volunteers for, for what X equals? Anyone? <laughs> Don't be shy. Let's see, I'll just uh, scroll down here and pick someone then. Um, Oh, your names aren't showing. Uh, whoops. How about, oops, oops, sorry. How about, uh, I forgot your name, but the fellow in Pennsylvania. Yeah, hi, my name is Nikita. Nikita, okay. What do you, what yeah. will you solve X as? So it will be helped? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Yeah. <laughs> so, uh, so, yeah. So not so hard. But uh, the point is, uh, historically speaking, it was holpen. Yeah. And if you, um, let's say, if you live in this country where I live, you occasionally hear holpen, uh, or hear is maybe the wrong word, but in, in choral evensong, the kind of uh, church service that Anglicans like to do in you know, for instance, in Cambridge University, it's a famous thing. There's a line, thou hast holpen thy servant, Israel. And when the queen writes a letter to members of the House of Lords once a year, telling them to show up to meetings, uh, the letter also uses the word holpen, even in 2020. Yeah. So the point excuse here me, is... Excuse yeah. me, but, but in uh, infinitive, to help, it will also be help. It's not like hope. I mean, historically speaking, in the so why there is this? In yeah. the infinitive, it's help. Uh, so, help. but historically okay. speaking, it should be help, hope, hopen. Okay. Um, uh, and the point is, at some point, you know, someone forgot that they should say hopen, and they say helped, and the way they decided to say helped was probably using an equation like talked is to talk as help is to open. So 
as a historian, you try to do these things backwards. So you say, for instance, okay, I see people say helped, uh, but based on, for instance, comparative evidence, um, it should be hope. Can I come up with an explanation for how you would go from one to another? And then, and then four-part analogy is the way to go. Now to give another one, uh, strive is to strove as dive is to, and then let me see if, um, maybe Sue, can you tell me the answer here? Yes, um, actually I saw this. You saw it, okay, yeah. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> it's, it's, it's a dove. It's dove, yeah. Um, it's dove, uh, and that replaced the inherited uh, dive. And I've set up these two examples uh, to make a point, which is that in the one case we have, uh, 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 let's say, a, a, the English, the, the word we use is a strong verb, but you can just think an irregular verb. It's becoming regular. And in the other case, you have a, uh, an, a, a regular verb, dive, dived. It's becoming irregular, dive, dove. So analogy can make things, um, can change things from one pattern to another. And, and it could go either way. That's the point I want to make, right? I, I think there's a, there's, a, there's a tendency in the way people uh, generally teach linguistics to say that in the first case, you have a rule like uh, in English, we form the past with ED uh, and, and that's a rule. Uh, whereas we need analogy for an explanation like the second one. Uh, and the point I want to make is actually that's not necessary, right? Analogy can get you both. So you don't need any rules. You can do everything with analogy. And then it's just a historical question of which models did people turn to when they didn't remember things correctly. And um, the... You know, that's, that's, a, that's a historical question that we can try and figure out. Uh, and uh, you might say even that strive, strove was uh, not the right model. Maybe it was drive, drove, or stri um, shrive, shrove, or something like that. But it's clear that, that whatever the model was that changed dive, dived into dove, uh, probably shared something uh, with it in terms of its phonology, like it it was an I've ove verb, yeah. Anyhow, so uh, the the let's just say those are the two uh, the two tools we have available as historians of language: regular phonology, uh, where you set up you know correspondences and reconstruct them, and analogy, which you can uh, use to explain cases where the correspondence patterns don't work. Uh, and um, you might be tempted to use other explanations. Uh, but I think that's uh, maybe sometimes required. But uh, it's, it's really like, you know, like in the old days, you did uh, geometry just with a, a compass and a, a straight edge. I think it's good to do as much historical linguistics as you can with just uh, regular phonology and analogy. And, uh, and then I just, you know, as I said, it's a throwaway comment. I don't think you need any kind of um, rules or deep structure in linguistics uh, to explain uh, how things got the way they are or, in, in fact, how people learn or what structure languages have. I think it can all be done through, through memory and forgetfulness, where memory is, is correctly reproducing what you learned and uh, forgetfulness is analogy, where you, where you use a part of the system that you do know to guess a part of the system that you've momentarily forgotten. Okay, now turning to Werte und Sachen. The words of, uh, of an ancestral language tell us about the objects and ideas of the world of its speakers. So let's just look at what 
the Sino-Tibetan, you know, world was like. Uh, and and how can I say? I, I think it's important, uh, or one thing to keep in mind here is, for the Indo-Europeans, we know a lot about uh, archaeology and genetics, and, and basically, you know, the Indo-Europeans are from north of the Black Sea, 4000 uh, BC, something like that. They were pastoralists. We don't know nearly as much about Sino-Tibetan, um, but uh, let's look at what words we can re reconstruct. They had lice, yeah? So uh, Tibetan and Chinese, uh, sorry about this capital F, it has to do with, it's a, it's a tricky Chinese character, which uh, my computer didn't want to make, even though I encoded it correctly. Uh, so anyhow, Chinese and Tibetan have uh, inherited words for lice, they have an inher inherited words for fish. They have uh, inherited word for field. And now I think this, so what are, we, what are we finding out? Well, I think everyone in the world has lice, so it's not particularly indicative. But if they have a word for fish, it means that they were living by the sea or by rivers. And not everyone does, right? There, there are certainly plenty of peoples in the world who, 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 for whom fish is not a very important part of their, of their diet. Uh, so we have learned something about possible geographic origins just by knowing that they have uh, a word for fish. And uh, in terms of the word for field, it suggests that uh, the Sino-Tibetans knew some form of agriculture. And uh, let's say for, 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 for um, archaeological reasons, it's clear that that wasn't rice agriculture. Um, it, it, millet seems to be the thing that goes back the the furthest uh, in among Sino-Tibetan speakers, uh, but also this word field might maybe we shouldn't imagine like a, a wheat field like in England or a rice paddy, but instead something like Sweden agriculture where where you burn down part of a forest uh, to plant in it, uh, which is a, a form of agriculture that's still practiced uh, in um, Northeast India. Uh, and they have a, a, a cognate word for field uh, that refer to those patches. But in any case, it's, it's clear that the Sino-Tibetan speakers probably weren't just hunter-gatherers, but had some kind of agriculture, as uh, indicated by this word for field. And they have a cognate word for uh, steel. So that suggests that they had, you know, some notion of uh, private property, because you can't steal if if you don't have a notion of private property. So, so we're starting to get a little bit of oppression of you know, the Sino Tibetans. They, they had lice, they had fish, they had fields, they stole from each other. Uh, and uh, what about their view of the afterlife? They had some kind of view of the afterlife. So they, they believed in, uh, in a soul. Now I want to look very briefly at, uh, at loan words. And so I should make some methodological observations. You know, we all uh, notice that, you know, the languages we speak, for instance, probably have a word for coffee or for tea that is similar to words for coffee and tea in unrelated languages. That's because the word spread with the technology. Uh, and these words, loan words, don't follow the inherited rules. So, Looking at the word for horse, uh, and, and, and here already I'm starting to have a kind of polemical uh, context because, uh, for instance, James Matisoff reconstructs a word horse for Sino-Tibetan, uh, noticing that uh, Tibetan, Burmese, and Chinese have similar words for horse. Uh, but they don't follow the right correspondence patterns. And in a forthcoming paper with some colleagues, we, um, we propose that actually uh, uh, the word for horse in Chinese is borrowed from Indo-Aryan. And if, if you're incredulous about the phonology of that, we can talk about that later. Uh, and then I'll also just point out that the horse came along with the chariot. And the chariot is, you know, the Indo-European uh, technology par excellence. It's probably, you know, why... Uh, Western Europe uh, and and much of India speaks Indo-European languages. Is it was, it was it was the nuclear bomb of its day, right? This kind of um, uh, amazing military innovation, the war chariot, uh, that led to uh, the Indo-Europeans having a, a, a remarkable 
advantage on the battlefield. And according to archaeology, uh, which is what I say here too, uh, it's, it's pretty clear that the Chinese learned about the war chariot from Indo-Europeans of some kind uh, around uh, 1250 BC. Uh, and along with it came the word for horse and chariot. So uh, let's say that maybe is interesting as details, but I think um, I want to, to, to make the methodological point, right? That, that here you have things that uh, befit the civilization of the time period you have in mind. Yeah, I, I'm almost surprised actually that the Sino-Tibetans had some form of agriculture because it's so long ago you would sort of expect maybe they wouldn't. Um, but they certainly didn't have uh, chariots, yeah, <laughs> and or horses. The, the, the horse, um, you know, was only used for eating for a long time. Uh, and um, and uh, spread in Asia, you know, under the influence of the Indo-Europeans uh, around uh, 1300, 1200 BC. Uh, so, so it's 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 it would be a bad sign if someone reconstructed the word for horse to Sino-Tibetan. But if we just reconstructed things based on what was archaeologically plausible, that would be poor methodology, right? You have to have the linguistics as linguistics lead to the right answer, and that right answer has to be compatible with the findings of archaeology. So in this case, I think uh, you know, it can be done, and it's that the horse and chariot are borrowed from Indo-Aryan. Okay, so that's, oh yeah, so that's it for this presentation, uh, and then I'll switch to the other presentation uh, with the second half of the lecture. Um, but just to sort of sum up, we have uh, a series of language families spreading out uh, from southern China around the world. Uh, and uh, we have two principles that guide us for studying history, regular phonology and analogy. And used judiciously, they should mm, tell us about uh, the, the, the kind of physical and social world of uh, prehistoric peoples. And if everything's going well, uh, the findings that we get through historical linguistics should match with the findings of archaeology. And now I'm just going to go through Sino-Tibetan subgroups. Hopefully it won't be too tedious. And I'm not going to do all of them. There's about 30. Uh, I'm not going to cover uh, Sinitic. I'm not going to cover Tibetan. Uh, but but uh, let's say partly based on the other speakers in this, um, in this uh, doctoral school, uh, my focus is in kind of southwestern China. Right? So, so and then, and then I'm, I'm going to kind of um, do it like I did for the other language families in terms of go from the more isolated more more um, small smaller groups to the larger groups so first we'll start with Trümmer Sprachen which are um, languages of fragmentary attestation then Mruik then Nungish then Karen then Sal then Kukichin then Burmo Chongik so for m most of you these are probably just names but you will get a little bit more uh, of a sense in just a moment so first we turn to uh, these Trümmersprachen, and there's two, Bailong and Pew. So looking at Bailong, by, the, by, the, the language Bailong is known from three songs that are pre preserved in the Hohan Shu, I think. Uh, and the songs were delivered at the Chinese court uh, around 58 to 75 uh, CE. So the 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 it's it's the language is not Chinese, but it's written in Chinese characters. And if we look at a few uh, words, they're they're clearly um, Sino-Tibetan. In some of the slides, you'll see Trans-Himalayan. Uh, that means the same thing as Sino-Tibetan. Basically, there's a kind of um, let's say a political battle going on among scholars in terms of which one's the better term. But um, it doesn't need to concern us. 
So we just look at some uh, words. We have a word saw that means meat. Looks very similar to Tibetan, Burmese, and, and Mizo. We have a word ruai, uh, which means rain. We have a word b, which means give. So it's clearly a Sino-Tibetan language, and it um, and it has relatively simple phonology. And I think uh, the the location, which is sort of southern China, and the relatively simple phonology m makes uh, W. S. Koblen and Christopher Beckwith say that. Uh, Bailong is uh, a low lowish language, which would mean it's related uh, to Hani, for example. Uh, but I don't think there is very good evidence for this. So in uh, in uh, Sagar, uh, so so there's a kind of let's say an important paper, an influential paper from last year about uh, Sino-Tibetan subgrouping, where they propose lexical innovations that are uh, kind of pinned on different subgroups. And if we look at burmo Changik, which is the branch above Liloish, uh, the only word that they think is indicative of burmo Changik as a subgroup that occurs in Bailong is this word uh, mus, which means heaven. But uh, this word doesn't just occur in burmo Changik. So Old Burmese has it, which is, which is Burma. So, so, oops, I sort of, I sort of mess, mixed myself up, but um, first, I'm proving that it does occur in, pro in Burma Chang, then I'll show that it also uh, occurs elsewhere. So in Old Burmese, we have this word uh, mui, which means sky, and in Japuk, uh, which is a, 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 a Gyaronic language of Sichuan that is studied by Giam Jok and is in, in many ways very archaic, they have this word uh, tumu, which means heaven. So, uh, so yeah, so this word is in Burma Chang. But it's also found in other branches. Um, so Tibetan has Dmu, which means a sky god, and Rawang, uh, which is a Nungish uh, language, has this uh, Dmo, which is a celestial spirit. Now, one thing that's actually kind of interesting to me, and I'm not going to push here, uh, but uh, you know, see what you think, uh, is. Uh, Maybe it's the meaning heaven specifically that's associated with Burma Changik, because you see that outside of Burma Changik, it it means sky god. So if that's true, then maybe it is evidence that Bailong is somehow uh, Burma Changik. But it just seems like a quite uh, quite a small difference to put a lot of emphasis on. So my point here is just that. Um, uh, yeah, that there's not a lot of evidence for uh, Bailong being low lowish. And then another thing that uh, that I just will flag to you that 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 I'm curious about that no one's really looked into is in terms of complicated syllable structure. You see that Japuk, Tibetan, and Rawang all have some kind of T or D um, at the beginning of this word, which you don't get in uh, Old Burmese or in Bailong. That's interesting. Uh, I don't think the loss of it is particularly meaningful because it's quite easy to lose uh, complicated uh, onsets and may have happened independently. But it's more uh, this general tendency that, that as you get sort of out of the core area, uh, the syllables become more simple. Uh, so both Burmese and Bailong have 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 uh, simplified their syllable structure. And I just want to make the point that, because someone might say, oh, no, 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 Bailong might have had complicated syllable structure, but it was the, 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 the problem of how to write this language in Chinese characters that meant, uh, that, that leads us as modern researchers to think it had um, uh, simple syllable structure. But I'll just point out that in the in the in the Sino-Tibetan um, peace treaty of uh, 821, the Tibetan word stuck, which means tiger, was written with Chinese characters as something like sirndak. So when the Chinese wanted to, they could write a complicated syllable structure, even though they didn't have it themselves. So that's a, 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 a point that that I think. Mm, the absence of complicated syllable structure in Bailong, we can think is a true reflection 
of the Bailong language. So that's it for Bailong, just three poems. Uh, for Pew, Pew is uh, an urban civilization that preceded the Burmese in, in, the upper, in upper Burma uh, from the 6th through the 13th century. And they are, let's say, among the earliest Buddhists in uh, Southeast Asia. And the oldest text in Pali uh, was found uh, in a reliquary excavated uh, from the Pew. So they knew Pali. Uh, Pew has quite conservative phonology. And I'll just look at that by looking at numbers. So uh, Pew tech meaning one, kni meaning two, ple for four, tanga for five, tko for nine. And I've given the, the Tibetan as just a kind of, um, I don't know, standard point of comparison. And then you notice that in some cases they're the same and in some cases they're not. Like the words for nine in Pew and, and Tibetan seem really remarkably similar, right? So the, the only thing that's different is really the, play, the manner of articulation. So you get voiceless tko in uh, Pew and you get dgu in uh, Tibetan. Uh, and then, um, but there are, there are differences, like you don't get the G prefix in, in the pew word for one, and you get a P instead of a L in five. So I don't, you know, I don't have explanations for a lot of this, but I think it's, uh, it's, it's interesting uh, to look at. And you see that uh, pew has quite complicated syllable structure as opposed to bylong. Oh, and then uh, let's look at water as well. Do water and chu in, in Tibetan. Uh, Pew so is is preserved in in let's say around a hundred inscriptions, most of them quite short, and was not really worked on at all uh, between around 1910 and the last couple years. But right now there's a kind of a renaissance of Pew scholarship uh, going on, uh, and I've I've put some citations there. Uh, uh, but there's plenty more to do. Yeah, so if you want to, uh, I don't know, look into Pew, uh, we can talk. Okay, so let's talk about, those are our two uh, fragmentarily attested languages. Uh, let's talk about what their features are. Because in some ways, they're kind of, have some surprising similarities. So uh, the first person singular pronoun in Bailong is ke, and in Pew is ge. So they're quite similar. And most languages of the Sino-Tibetan uh, family have a first person pronoun like nga. So Tibetan does, Chinese does, Burmese does. Uh, so that's interesting. Uh, and Van Beek, uh, who, who worked on proto kuki Chin, doesn't, didn't have any awareness of Pew or Bailong, uh, sees um, ke as the first person singular in kuki Chin. Kuki Chin are, um, are languages spoken in, in, in northern Burma. He sees that as indicative of a Kuki Chin language, um, which would suggest that Bailong and Pew are also Kuki Chin. But I just want to point out that, that around the family, we do have these kind of similar first person singular uh, pronouns sneaking around here and there. So Oleka is a language uh, uh, of uh, Bhutan. And their first person is ke, and then there's a language uh, pushi chung, uh, which has a first person ka. So I mean, I don't know. I, I don't want to, you know, um, overstress this in terms of like pu ge and and uh, kuki chin ke are very similar, but it's just to say I don't. I don't. That might indicate that pu is a kuki chin language. It might not. The whole question of the distribution of, let's say, na like pronouns and ge like pronouns in the Sino Tibetan family needs more study. Um, but uh, but but it's it is just interesting to notice that, that our two tumer, tumer sprache have the sort of less normal first person singular pronoun. Okay, so that was it for tumer sprache. Now we look at mruik. So, so Mruik is, uh, is, is, it only has two members, Mru and Anu uh, Kongso. It's spoken in the highlands of Burma and Bangladesh. 
uh, and has really almost not been worked on. So Loeffler uh, has an article from 1966, and then David Peterson uh, of Dartmouth is working on it now, but he hasn't really published anything. Uh, and uh, Loeffler does some, some comparisons with other sign and languages. It's rare uh, for distinguishing final R, final L, and final Y. Although, just and this is just me having looked at some of the words, it doesn't look like the L uh, words are necessarily inherited. Sorry, did someone say something? Okay. Um, I mean, maybe this is just a, a, a kind of the problem with me knowing Tibetan, but Mru words look to me a lot like Tibetan. So if we look at pig, pak in mru, and pak in Tibetan, uh, the word for house, kim in mru, and kim in Tibetan, and the word for bear, tom in mru, and dom in Tibetan. And um, let's say these words tend to occur all throughout sign Tibetan, but oftentimes won't look quite like this. So for instance, in Burmese, the word for home is yim, not kim, and the word for bear is wom, not dom, or something like that. So, you know, what is going on here with mru? I just think it's, it's, it, 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 I just wanted to, you know, say, I think there's, mru is juicy, and people should uh, work on it more. Okay, we'll look at the numbers. Uh, so we have uh, chum, tali, Tanga, Taruk, Ranit, Ryat, Taku. Yeah. So uh, you don't, you, you know, probably your memory isn't perfect, but uh, if you look at Taku, and then let's go back to the Pew numbers. Uh, nine, Tuko in Pew, Tugu in Tibetan. So quite similar, right? which I think is indicative of, of, of shared inheritance, right? This is to say Mru is a very archaic language. Uh, and then I just uh, want to make a proposal here, uh, which is, so we have these ta's, these ta prefixes, right? So I think that in six and nine, uh, it's etymological, where you get it, for instance, also in Tibetan, but probably spread via contamination uh, to four and five. And, and contamination, I think I'll deal with this uh, later, but is, is the process whereby languages, uh, sorry, words that are part of a semantic subsystem influence each other. Uh, the textbook example is that uh, whereas French has mal and femelle for male and female, in English we changed female to female to make it look more like male. So it's, it's, it's a way that words that are associated in meaning uh, influence each other's form. Very common in numeral systems uh, for adjacent numerals. And then does the, you know, we, we saw, uh, do, do, does the ch reflect the k prefix of three in, 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 in the word for three, chum in maru, Gsum in Tibetan. I think it doesn't. Uh, and I compare the word for tree in Tibetan, which is shing, uh, to ching in, in Maru. So it seems like Maru just changed their S's to, to Chuz somehow. Okay, so that's it for Maru. Now on to Nungish. There are three Nungish languages, Trung, Rawang, and Anong. You've already heard about uh, Rawang spoken on both sides of the Sino-Burmese border. So uh, just to remind you about the sort of trajectory of my presentation, we're going from you know, tiny fragmentary languages to bigger ones. So we're still at a quite small branch that only has three uh, language families. And the speakers of these families are switching to Loloish languages. Uh, so, so I mean, one thing that, that I think um, some, is easy to forget in a kind of global context uh, where like English is in charge and then, uh, I don't know, um, if you're in Germany, for instance, you would say, oh, okay, well, we speak German and then in, in, in some parts of higher education, we speak English. 
Whereas if you're a, a, a sorb, you'll say like, okay, we speak uh, uh, in, some, in, in, in some kind of context, we speak English, in some kind of context, we speak German. And then in the home, maybe I speak Sorbian with my grandmother. So there are those kind of layers all throughout the world. And in, in this part of uh, the Sino-Tibetan border region, actually Lisu is the language that is taking over Trung, uh, Rawang, and Anong. Even though, you know, international Lisu might not be very strong. Anyhow, no reconstructions of, of Proto-Nungish, although I think it's a, uh, an exciting area to look. Also, it wouldn't be that hard because there's only three languages. Now, just deep breath now. Karen. So Karen uh, is the most southern of all uh, Tibetan Burman languages. And it has SVO syntax like Chinese. All other languages have SOV syntax. Uh, and it has very simple syllable structure. About 20 to 30 languages, 16 of them reasonably well documented. Uh, just the famous ones, Saga, Po, Kayan, Li, Bue. Karen is kind of exciting because it was one of the first uh, sub-branches that was worked on uh, historically by uh, Audrey Cour, who, uh, if his name doesn't mean anything to you, uh, you should look into him. He is the person who explained the origin of tones in Chinese. Uh, he worked on Vietnamese and he worked uh, on uh, Proto-Karen and identified that Karen had a tonal split very similar to Middle Chinese, to Thai, and to Vietnamese. Uh, and uh, he reconstructed a series of voiceless nasals, uh, so things like hna, hna, that was later confirmed in field work by Gordon Luce. So I think that's, a, how can I say, a great endorsement of a methodology that I think is a cool thing about historical linguistics is you can, uh, you can have the method lead you to deposit something and then have it confirmed uh, later. And the, you know, the famous example of that is the, the Indo-European laryngeals, which were reconstructed by Dersasur and then were found in Hittite. But I just want to point out, here is a little example in Sino-Tibetan, the voiceless nasals of Karen were predicted by Audrey Kaur and then were confirmed by Luce. And then uh, there seems to be an isogloss characteristic of Karen, not a very interesting one, to change nga into nya. Uh, one of the most interesting Karen languages is, is this one, Pao, uh, because most Karen languages have so radically simplified their, their syllable structure that it's just, there's no finals at all. They have syllables like pa and ma and ma, but not uh, pat and bak and mak. But pao has nasal, so it has things like uh, pang versus pam. Uh, but unfortunately, it's quite understudied. So, so I mean, what, an another sort of leitmotif of my talks will be like, there are really low hanging fruit out there. So if you want to become rich and famous, you know, just uh, <laughs> pick a Sino-Tibetan language and, and you can make, uh, you know, uh, discoveries that will forever change the field. So now that was it for Karen. Uh, now I'm going to move on to uh, this family, Saul. So Saul is a, is a, and now we're getting to the bigger family. This is a big family. Uh, it was, uh, proposed by uh, Robbins Burling on the basis of the word for son. So Saul languages have a word for son that's like Saul. Uh, and uh, other languages have a word like uh, ni or, or yeah, so ni, ni is what you have in, in Tibetan and in, in Chinese. There are three uh, sub branches. Uh, Bodogaro, Konyak, and uh, Jingpo Luish. Bodogaro and Konyak are both mostly spoken in India, and then Jingpo Luish on the sort of uh, Chinese, Burmese, Indian border region. So we're going to look at Jingpo Luish a little bit, uh, the most uh, 
I don't know, the, the, the Jingpo is, is the more famous of the two pieces. And it's being studied uh, these days by a Japanese uh, study, uh, a Japanese young scholar, uh, Kurabe. It's the majority language of Kachin state in Burma. So, so similarly, like uh, if you speak uh, uh, something like Lashi at home, you'll speak uh, Jingpo in the market in Kachin state. And it's also spoken in India and China. It's one of the five Sino-Tibetan languages that was used by uh, Benedict in his reconstruction of Sino-Tibetan from 1972. And I think that's just, I mean, I don't, I, that work is so out of date now that it's basically useless, but I just uh, think it's maybe helpful to mention to people that Jingpo, I would even say of all the languages I've mentioned so far, is probably one that you'll hear about more because it has been used a lot in Sino-Tibetan. Um, and it has quite archaic features, including iambic syllables. That's, you know, like we've seen with uh, Pew and with Mru, things like, you know, Taruk is an iambic syllable. Preservation of final R and final J. So that's it for the Jingpo side. And, um, uh, well, I think one thing that's been sort of frustrating, at least to me, about Jingpo in the past is that it's quite well documented, it's quite archaic, it's very interesting, it's been used in Sino-Tibetan, but it, there wasn't anything to compare it to immediately. Like comparing Jingpo and Tibetan, Jingpo and Chinese feels like it's quite far. Uh, but this has just started to change with, with uh, work uh, by this uh, guy whose uh, name is pronounced Fujiwara. Uh, because he's Japanese, but he writes it using the old nationalist uh, transliteration scheme. So you will see it in bibliographies as Huziwara. Uh, and he has been uh, working on, uh, so he's written a grammar of Chak, uh, done a, a reconstruction of Luish. Uh, so this, this is a, a, a group of very small languages also spoken in basically the same uh, areas. And I personally think that work on the relationship between uh, Jingpo and uh, Luish will be one of the most exciting uh, areas of, uh, of Sino-Tibetan in the coming years. So now comes uh, Kukichin. The last two are going to be Kukichin and Burma Changik, which are uh, things I know a little bit more about, uh, but also are a little bit more complicated. So Kuki Chin, now you get a, uh, uh, a tree diagram. Don't need to uh, go through all of this. Uh, and I'll share all these um, uh, slides. Um, uh, but anyhow, so Kuki Chin, Chin is spoken in uh, where like Burma and Bangladesh meet. Uh, in the hills. So you have the Chin Hills on the Burmese side and the Chittagong Hills on uh, the Bangladeshi side. And they have uh, an interesting uh, verbal system where they have verb agreement, so person agreement, like let's say like Indo-European languages. And they have an alternation between two verb stems. Uh, one, which we call stem one, used mostly in uh, finite contexts and the other one, stem two, used in uh, subordinate contexts. The central branch is the best studied with Mizu uh, as another one of Benedict's uh, five reference languages. So his, his, lang his, his reference languages were Tibetan, Burmese, uh, Mizu, uh, Jingpo, and Chinese maybe? I'm not sure if I remember the last one. Anyhow, it doesn't matter. Um, and I will just point out, in case you've, you've heard, uh, you know, the words mean anything to you. Uh, Mizo is the majority language of Mizoram, which is a state in India. Uh, although most things happen in English in, in Mizoram. And uh, the change of R into G is characteristic of the Northeast branch. That's something that has been discussed a lot. Uh, uh, yeah, uh, but uh, David Peterson 
has shown convincingly that it's a it's a late change that spread through contact and is not um, indicative of a, of of a subgroup per se. Uh, Proto Kuki Chin is is has been worked on, so uh, somehow uh, recently it's come back into fashion. Let's say so. So Toru Ono uh, did a basic reconstruction in in the nineteen sixties. Uh, but then uh, Chris Budden and Ken Van Beek both had reconstructions around the same time. And then I, I've also worked on Proto Kuki Chin a little bit. In general, the northern languages are conservative in their rhymes, and the southern languages are conservative in their initials. So that's kind of elegant, isn't it? Um, existing reconstructions rely mostly on. Uh, the northern languages uh, because more data, data has been available on them. One thing that happens especially in Burma but 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 in this whole region is the languages where the population has converted to Christianity end up being better studied because people want to translate the Bible into that language and need to compile dictionaries and whatnot. So that's definitely what's happened in this case which is that speakers of northern Kugichin languages converted to Christianity and then have been better studied, whereas speakers of Southern Kugichin languages uh, have retained their um, traditional religions and have been uh, less studied. Uh, but that is slowly changing. Uh, and uh, just last year, there was a kind of a dump of data uh, on surveying of varieties of the Southern uh, uh, Chin languages. Um, that has been shared on on Zenodo, which is a European uh, Research Council's research data repository. Okay, so that's what I will say about Guichin, and now comes Burmo Changik, where where things are uh, are quite uh, complicated. So first, and here I will kind of really talk through the the different uh, bits. Uh, the 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 Stammbaum, the family tree of Burmo Changik. Uh, I should say, with all of these family trees, take it with a grain of salt. I have been very uh, in the past very against drawing family trees because I feel like you shouldn't draw them until you're sure they're right. Each node should you should be able to say precisely what changed uh, and know that it changed from you know from uh, this into that. Uh, but uh, now I've become a little bit more relaxed and I feel like it's a good way of organizing information, organizing our thinking, and, and reveals the state of scholarship, even if we have to keep in mind that, that, that most of this stuff could change, hopefully will, will change as more research is done. But anyhow, here's Burmo Changik, which has sort of two halves broadly, broadly. Uh, Na Changik. Um, which uh, then has three branches, Nayak, Ursuik, and Changik. And, Urs and Changik uh, has four branches, Prinni, uh, Muya, or Munya, also Minyak. I, I heard uh, someone here works on uh, rituals among the, the Minyak. Rma, which is, uh, used to be called Chang, Chang. Uh, but uh, there's good reason to call them Rma because that's what they call themselves and because they have no relationship as far as we can tell to the historic Chang people of, uh, of Chinese history. And then the uh, Gyalrong, Gyalrongic family that will get its own slide later later on. So that's it for the Na Changik family and then looking at Lolo Burmese there are two branches Loloish and Burmish. Uh, Loloish has quite a lot going on, which we'll look at later. Uh, but on Burmish, it's quite clean. You have a Burmic and uh, Maruic split. And generally speaking, the Na Changik languages are more conservative, uh, and the Lolo Burmese languages are a little bit more innovative in terms of their phonology, for example. So, uh, first of all, just to mention that the idea that Lolo, Lolo Burmese and Changik have some relationship. So if you like this Burmo Changik hypothesis has been kicking around for a while. Uh, so you have some citations. Dempsey 1995 is, is, uh, is, the, is the earliest that I've sort of run across. 
Um, but uh, this paper by uh, uh, Guillaume Jacques and Alexis Michaud in 2011, I think really sort of started to be when this idea became something more widely accepted. And even now, I think there are a lot of Sino-Tibetanists who don't uh, believe in Burma Chongik, but, uh, but I do. So, uh, <laughs> so, you know, so you'll get to hear about it. And then I just discussed these subgroups, uh, Naik, Ursuik, Chongik, including Gyalrongik, Lola Burmese. And then let's just mention what are the ancient languages in this uh, family. Most of the, I think, the families I've been mentioning so far, Tibet or Burman branches, have, don't, don't, have not had ancient languages. So there's Tongut from 1036, which is Gyalronic. There's Burmese, first attested in 1113, which is Burmish. There's Yi, first attested in 1485, which is Loloish. And then there's Nashi, uh, and uh, people say, people like to say, you know, that uh, in China, that Nashi is as old as the hills, uh, but there are no manuscripts that are obviously from before the 18th century. So let's say a Nashi uh, is from the 18th century, and it's a Naik uh, language. So basic, so more or less, each uh, branch has its own uh, old language. So some features of uh, Burma Chongik are uh, plain versus velarized vowels. I'm not a phonetician, so I, I won't be able to do these, but I, I think, let's say, uh, in a language like, um, like Zbu, if you take the letter, the vowel ah, this would be a difference between a real ah and an ah. Um, and then a complex system of directional prefixes that double as past tense markers. And this is a very uh, fun thing about these languages where, um, for example, for a motion verb, you'll have go and then you'll have prefixes that mean uh, downstream, upstream, towards the mountain. It can vary uh, between different languages. And then for verbs like eat, uh, or, I don't know, uh, things that don't have it to do with motion, it tends to be that one of those prefixes will be associated with that verb in the past tense. So it might be that you eat downstream. Yeah. Uh, although, you know, semantically, that's not what's going on. And I personally think that that's, the system is sort of um, comparable to the uh, perfective prefixes that you get in, in, in Russian where like basically every verb has a perfective equivalent, but the prefix that it uses can be different. And those differences do have some semantics, but are largely uh, just grammaticalized. And uh, they have uh, inverse agreement on uh, the verb. And I will just say a tiny word about inverse agreement and you'll tell me how good my explanation is, but it's something that took me a long time to wrap my head around. So, uh, so don't worry about it. Uh, but here's uh, what it is. In European languages, we tend to index the, let's say, the, the subject. So you have like, um, let me think of a nice uh, Indo-European language like Spanish. You would say, uh, tengo, tienes, tiene, right? And then you know, oh, I have, you have, he has. And the ending indicates who the subject is. In a language that has inverse agreement, you, you have a sort of assumed way of things normally happening. And that is a hierarchy that goes first person, second person, third person. So it's much more likely that I will do something to, for example, an inanimate object than that the inanimate object will do something to me. And then the person marking uh, marks the involvement of the person in any way. So like if, if I, um, I don't know, if I give you a hug, it, it marks, it would be first person because I'm involved. And if I'm involved, it's always first person. If, if I'm not involved and you're involved, then it's second person. And then only if neither you or I are involved is it marked as third person. And that involvement can be a subject or object. But if 
the the relationship is the reverse of what would be normal. So exam for example, uh, if if I say I ate a cheeseburger, then that's a normal relationship. But if I say uh, the cheeseburger ate me, that would be an inverse relationship where a third person is acting on the first person. That would be marked as first person and inverse. So that's my simple sort of attempt at, at describing inverse marking, which is that um, in, the, in, in the West, we ignore the object and we mark the subject. In uh, Burma Chang languages that have person marking, you mark uh, the person regardless of their uh, role. But if the relationship is the reverse of what would be normal, then you put uh, the inverse marker. So that's quite an interesting uh, system. The more conservative languages show all of these features, and uh, but in, in many sub-branches, only relics of them survive, uh, or, or they're only indirectly observable. And I don't think that, that this uh, means much in terms of uh, subgrouping. But uh, because, because let's say complicated hard things are easy to lose. So where you see them, they're old. Where you don't see them, they've been lost. But they could be lost in different ways at different times by different languages. So in the 1960s and 70s, the, the, the focus of research was on Lolo-ish languages, uh, largely because, because uh, ch uh, China and Burma were inaccessible to researchers. So they worked mostly in Thailand. And although Thailand is not a place that has a lot of Burma Chung languages, even of the Loloish branch, those Tibeto Burman languages that are spoken in Thailand tend to be Loloish. So that's why people in the 60s and 70s uh, worked on uh, Loloish. But I would say today it's in the Chungik side where you see uh, the vanguard of neo grammarian progress in Transcendental Malayan Reconstruction, which is, I think, the, the particularly the Gyalronic languages, but, but more generally Changik is where exciting things are happening in Sino-Tibetan. And I think both that has to do with that they're very exciting languages, but I also think it has to do with that the people who are working on them uh, tend to be uh, quite good and uh, diligent in their work. So uh, just to talk you through sort of some, you know, the, to prove my point, that this is where progress is happening recently. Guillaume Jacques in 2014, uh, did a, a com comparison of Tangut and Jokuk Gyarong in, um, in phonology and grammar. And uh, by bringing those examples together in a sort of systematic way, his student uh, was able to notice that um, the, the, tong, uh, the, the Tangut grades, this is a, a term from Middle Chinese phonology, uh, which either, if, if you know about Middle Chinese phonology, you'll know what it is, and if, if you don't, uh, consider yourself lucky. <laughs> um, but anyhow, Tongut is analyzed like Middle Chinese, because that was the uh, uh, phonological tradition that Tonguts had access to, and they analyzed their vowels according to grades. And uh, Gongshun discovered that these grades correspond to the velarized, non-velarized distinction in Gyalronic languages. So that's, I think, a, a, a real step forward in uh, Sino-Tibetan historical phonology. And then similarly, also in 2020, uh, Nathaniel Sims, who's a PhD student at Santa Barbara, uh, published a paper where he showed that the tonal contrasts of Northern Chang dialects correspond to the two Tonga tones. And this is interesting because Jonathan Evans, who had worked on uh, Chang historical phonology, thought that the, uh, the non-tonal varieties were conservative and the tonal varieties uh, had, had evolved tone in some way. So Sims shows that, that the opposite is the case, that it must be that the, the non-tonal Chang varieties lost tone uh, because there's a systematic correspondence between Tonga tone and uh, Chang tone. So that means we can reconstruct tonal distinctions and this velarized, non-velarized uh, distinction 
you know, maybe up to the Na Chongik level. It's a little unclear, but those features are old and the details are getting figured out. So I um, mean, just 2020, good year for um, uh, Burmo Chongik historical phonology. No real work has yet been done at the Burmo Chongik level itself, which is to say, so, so stuff has been done on Lolo Burmese, stuff has been done on, on Burmish, Stuff has been done on Gyarong and on Chang'ik, uh, but no one has really brought that all together. And uh, I think that makes sense because it's a lot of work. So here's uh, the Nayak branch, the smallest uh, probably. So you have Nayak, and, uh, and, and basically, unless I say otherwise, this is all southern China we're talking about, from Sich Sichuan, Yunnan. So Nayak has uh, three branches under it, Namuyi, which is one language, Shumi, which is one language, and Nayish, which is three languages, Nashi, Na, and Laze. Generally not a well-researched uh, branch, so if you're wondering you know, what to do with your life, uh, maybe work on Nayak. So there's uh, Namuyi, uh, just a couple articles about. Shumi is currently being worked on by Katya Chirgova. And then for Naish, Nashi is the best known. Uh, it's famous for its representational writing system uh, that is used in, in liturgical uh, documents uh, by the Dongba priests. And um, uh, uh, yeah, and uh, Alexi Michaud has a sort of sh survey article about it in Brill's um, Encyclopedia of Chinese Language and Linguistics, which is a very useful resource uh, for any of you who don't know about it. And then uh, Yongning Na, I think, is the best, uh, which is, you know, it's, it's easy to mix up, but Na is one language and Nashi is another language. Uh, so Yongning Na is the best studied Naik language. Uh, where an, an, an overall grammar was published in 2010 and then a book specifically about tone in 2017 by Alexi Michaud. And they have a very complicated um, tone Sunday uh, system. And then Laze is, is really not very well studied. Um, uh, uh, there's one article by Alexi Michaud and Guillaume Jacques. Um, but yeah, I was surprised how little I could find out about uh, Laze. So Nayak reconstruction, uh, 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 Guillaume Jacques and Alexis Michaud s made some preliminary efforts in 2011 in an article uh, published in Diachronica. And Li Zihe of, uh, of Peking University has done uh, some forays into Nayish uh, reconstruction since then. Uh, I, I found his work a, a little paradoxical because he's he criticizes um, uh, uh, Guillaume Jacques and Alexei Michaud for making comparisons with Gyarong because you know if you're reconstructing Nayish you shouldn't peek at Gyarong um, which was kind of their methodological point where they were saying it's useful to have an archaic language to interpret more innovative languages uh, but uh, Li Zihe himself uses uh, Tibetan uh, comparisons in his reconstruction of, of Nayish which is even further away so it seems a little bit uh, unfair of him to criticize uh, um, Alexi and Guillaume while kind of playing the same trick himself. Uh, but uh, in any case, I think that uh, we won't see a lot more progress in proto naik until uh, some of the languages are better understood, Laze in particular. Okay, so that's it for Nayak. Now we're moving on to Ursuic. And this, uh, I, I hope, will be uh, a particularly fun one. This is a very small uh, branch. We're in Burma Changik, right? So Ursuic has three members, Tosu, Ursu, and Lizu. Lizu with a Z, not to be confused with Lisu, which is a Loloish language. So three languages, like I said. Uh, Dominic Yu, in his Berkeley 2012 PhD, surveys previous work and provides an initial reconstruction, but most of the changes he discusses, like this A to E, which we call brightening, uh, is not very diagnostic. It's very, all the languages in this part of China changed A to E, basically. 
there's a uh, new data uh, on Ursu and Tosu since uh, use study. And I will now uh, look at that a little bit with, and, and this was my, I don't know, uh, to, to try and uh, spice things up and not just have it be, oh, long lists of names in, in, in of minority groups in Southern China. Uh, we'll do a little bit, uh, kind of an exercise in historical linguistics of, uh, of Ursuic reconstruction together and then see um, some, some of the methodological principles we discussed earlier. So if we look at the words for son and daughter in Proto-Ursuic in 2012, U reconstructs Z for son based on uh, these two forms. And he reconstructs two forms for daughter, Z Yo and Z Yi, based respectively on uh, these two forms and then the next two forms, you see? So the first two support uh, Z Yo and the second two support Z Yi. Okay, well, uh, 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 this is a methodological point that that I will devote a whole lecture to basically, but proto or Suic did not have two similar looking words for daughter. It doesn't happen in languages, right? Like uh, <laughs> either they had different words, one that meant, you know, uh, daughter of, I don't know, older daughter and younger daughter, or one meant daughter and one meant daughter-in-law or something like that, or, they there's only one reconstruction and he has a, a, a formal problem, right? Either there's a formal problem or a semantic problem. That's the point. But if someone reconstructs two different similar looking words, meaning the same thing, it means they've done a bad job. That's my um, view on the matter. So then uh, we're going to try and solve this uh, problem right now. Yeah. So that's unsatisfactory. So, uh, I think Zio, that's his first of the two words for daughter, is innovative. Uh, because the beginning of it is the same as the word for son. So you could imagine that it's son plus some suffix. And indeed, there is a diminutive suffix, uh, yo, that comes up in the word for calf and the word for mouse. These are in his, his reconstructions. So Zio is analyzable as a compound of a word for son and a diminutive suffix. So like you would call your daughter, your little son, something like that, or your, your, you could think maybe child and little child or something like that. And uh, the association of, of feminine meaning with diminutive is found all throughout the world, including in Sanskrit. So I think the semantics works. And that means I can, I can drop zio, right? Like, uh, if we have these two words, ziyo and zye yi, ziyo is the newer one, uh, and zye yi is the older one, yeah? And then this also means, incidentally, that mingyin, sorry, mianning lizu and kala lizu, as documented by one person, by Huang Bufan, uh, and Earth, like are, are, are a subgroup. Why? Because they changed what their word for daughter was. Because they both support the newer word for daughter. And something like changing what your word for daughter is, is a pretty big change. So I think that's very strong evidence of subgrouping. So, so let's say that's one thing that I will, I'm trying to, uh, that I'm trying to make a kind of methodological point of is, Dominic, you just said, oh, there are two words for daughter in proto ursuic But we can do better. We can squeeze a lot more juice out of this. One is by figuring out that one of the two words has to be younger than the other. And a corollary of that is any languages that support the younger reconstruction must have had a period of shared history. So must be part of a, a, a sub-branch together. Whereas if, if, if you've preserved the old word for daughter, it doesn't mean anything. Okay. So now we just have to look at this other word for daughter, zye yi. So let's do that. Well, in a conference paper in 2019, uh, you seems to update, this is on the basis of new TOSU data, 
his reconstruction from Zie Yi to Zhang Yi. So let's see why he did that. He did that because the Tosu words for son and daughter are Zi, which we are not surprised by, and Zami. And then he uh, reconstructs the, if you like, the roots back to uh, Zi and Zan. So I'm not quite so sure on why he does Zan, but uh, by implication, he sees the Yi that we saw in his earlier reconstruction uh, and now in the Zan Yi form uh, as unrelated to the Mi in Tosu, right? It, it, there's just by implication, he doesn't say anything about it and they, they're not the same, so they must be unrelated, right? Well, I, I think that's, um, again, not very elegant. So let's look at this um, Z versus Zan, because you wouldn't really expect a language to have, uh, you know, how can I say, uh, similar words for son and daughter that, that aren't following some pattern, at least ultimately historically. You know, you would want it to be like child plus feminine suffix or something like that. But you explains that he sees here uh, what are called allophams, which just means variants, uh, in Matasov's Tibeto-Burman reconstruction, za versus zan. So his explanation is that za stayed za, no, uh, and then when the a to e sound change happened, the za changed into z. And then the uh, zan is some kind of variant word for child that uh, the n suffix kind of uh, mm, protected it from the a to e change, which is why you then uh, have zami. That's, that's his explanation. But I think this is not very likely, uh, where if we look at the similarity between tosu zami and tangmi, Tsamai for daughter, and Tangmi is spoken way in over in the middle of Nepal. So I think uh, it, it, it cannot be the case that, that the, the similarity between uh, this uh, Tosu form in Sichuan and this uh, form in Nepal, uh, it must be inherited, it must be an, an, a sign of being old. So I think that means uh, the An reconstruction should be updated to Am, first of all. And I would explain that uh, Proto-Ursuic first had the Za son and the Zami daughter, quite similar to Tangmi. Uh, and then brightening, that's this change of A to E, only happened in open syllables. So then, so then you get Z and Zami, right? And then just by way of comparison, uh, Tosu has another word, Nama, sister, which uh, he, you, reconstructs to uh, uh, Name with two Ms. And why does he have two Ms there? Well, the first M he's using to close the first syllable in order to block the A to E chain. And the second M he's using to explain the ma suffix. But I don't think it's necessary. I think why not use the one M for both purposes? And then you could just reconstruct uh, name. And then here I'm just pointing out that then structurally speaking, it's exactly the same as, you know, uh, zami from zami and uh, nama from, you know, nama basically. Yeah, it's, it's not rocket science. Um, and then if you compare it, Tibetan, uh, has the word nyama, which means young lady. So I think that's related to this word for sister. Okay, so that was kind of a, a, a mini, uh, I don't know, uh, uh, a lemma, if you like, a, 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 a distraction, but uh, proves a point methodologically, which is if you see someone reconstructing two variants for the same meaning, They've done something wrong, and it could be that solving the problem is quite easy. So, I mean, this, like, I don't know anything about these languages. Uh, 
I came at this totally naive, you know, reading his PhD, like any of you. And if you come to, if you just read a PhD naively and say, okay, the only tools I allow myself are historical phonology and analogy, uh, and I can notice people's mistakes, like when they reconstruct two words that are similar in form and the same in meaning, then you too can make uh, rapid progress in, in uh, improving our understanding of, of Sino-Tibetan linguistics. So it's just, a, it's just a question of commitment to the right principles, I think. So now let's uh, continue on with Shangik, which I, I haven't made a slide of because the, the structure is so simple. We have Prinmi, Munya, uh, Rma, and Gyalrangik as our four branches of uh, Changik. And then Gyalrangik itself, so now we're three layers down, right? Burmo Changik, Changik, Gyalrangik uh, is a little more complicated. And this one I think is worth uh, talking through. So we have two branches. This is based on very new research uh, of uh, a, a group of people, but uh, with the lead author is Lai Yunfan. Um, so we have West Gyalrangik, which has Tongut, Horpa and Kroschap. And then you have East Gyalronic, which has Situ, Japuk, Sovdun, and Zbu. Uh, Zbu is probably the most archaic language, I don't know, in the whole Burmo Changik family. Uh, but uh, Japuk is the most easy one for anyone to get to grips with because it's what Guillaume Jacques has been writing about uh, uh, very copious, cop copiously for a long time now. Uh, and then you see where Tongut is as well. So Tongut is 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 there uh, next to Horpa and Kroschap. Uh, so looking at uh, West Gyalronic, it's confined to Sichuan except for Tongut. I think Galambo's 2015 is a, a good introduction to Tongut studies in English. Yeah. The Tongut Empire uh, lasted from uh, nine, uh, 984 to 1227 in today's Ningxia, and and they were. They were destroyed by the Mongols, uh, but also uh, killed Genghis Khan. So, you know, at least uh, <laughs> it wasn't a total loss, yeah. Uh, and then uh, moving on to Horpa is a nice uh, in, in, over, a survey article uh, in this um, Sino-Tibetan linguistics book published by Rutledge uh, in 2017. Uh, Crosschap is is worked on by Lang Yunfan. That's his kind of fieldwork language. And then East Gyalronic, there's a there's a nice survey article again by Guillaume Jacques. It's first attested in a Huayi Yiyu vocabulary, which are the Bureau of Translators in in I don't know what to say in pre-modern China uh, compiled vocabularies of foreign languages. And one of them is a East Gyalronic language, although exactly which one isn't uh, totally well understood. And then there's Situ, Japuk, and Sobdun, as I've mentioned. And now I just want to say, you know, and, and this, I don't know, I, I, I will sound a lot like Guillaume Jacques, but I think the Gyalronic languages are extremely important in Sino-Tibetan uh, linguistics for giving uh, a model for morphology in the way that Sanskrit did for Indo-European. And I'll give you a, an example, like in English, we have these causatives, sit, set, um, drink, drench, uh, but you, you wouldn't know what to do with them in English. You're just like, oh, okay, you, you change the vowel somehow and then it makes it a causative. Uh, but in Sanskrit, it's, it's very clear. You add the aya suffix. And then that synchronic fact in Sanskrit uh, becomes a key to unlock the diachronic history of that causative formation across the language family. And I think that uh, Gyalrong will play a similar role in Sino-Tibetan languages for having a lot of morphology that's still, um, that's still synchronically productive. Okay, so now we're done with the Changik side and we move to Burmish. Uh, this is the Burmish family. It has two sub-branches, Burmic and Maruik. Uh, and then Burmic just has two sides, all Burmese, and then all the modern Burmese dialects under it, and then Nochang, and then Maruik has a bunch of little languages, uh, Pela, Lachid, uh, Lauvo, and Zaiwa, but in, in order for these not to just be words, remember Jingpo was the dominant language of Kachin state in northern Burma, 
the, these languages are the less dominant uh, languages of Kachin state in northern Burma. So, so basically, Kachin state has an ethnic and linguistic diversity. All of the little languages are, uh, are uh, Maruic, so Burmish, uh, and the dominant language is Jingpo, which is a Sal language. So Burmish is uh, circa seven languages in, in northern Burma and adjoining regions of the PRC. Uh, and then you just saw this list. Um, and so uh, let's look at, and this is an area I've worked on so I can give more details in other areas. Is this split real, the two sides, Burmic versus Maruic? Well, uh, Burmic languages merge the pre-glottalized stops of Proto-Burmish as aspirates. So if we look at the word six in Proto-Burmish, it's krok. And uh, you, so in Burmese, it's, it's krok in, uh, in, I'm not so great at reading IPA, so please forgive me, but in uh, Longchuan, uh, Nochan, it's something like shudraw, but with a high tone. Uh, and then in Zaiwa, Q in, in Pella, Kiao. Now, if we look at Frighten, and you notice that it's very similar, but with a pre glottalized initial, Frighten, Kruk, exactly the same. It, like, so, so, which is a Burmese cannot distinguish the word six from the word Frighten, and neither can Lo Chuan, uh, Lo Chang, which is, a good, is good evidence of a merger but you see that in Zaiwa and Pella, they're different, yeah? So they're not aspirated and they have a creaky vowel. And that uh, is why we have to reconstruct there as being a difference at the Proto-Burmish level. Uh, and there's a clear Burmic isogloss of merging that distinction. So that proves that what I'm calling Burmic is a, is a real branch, is a real clade. Uh, but previously, and where previously is just uh, you know, a year ago, I expressed reservations about the reality of Maruic because uh, Yoshio Nishi, the guy who first uh, proposed this Burmic versus Maruic distinction, he uh, he only pointed to evidence that Maruic was a was sorry that Burmic had this isogloss I just discussed of, of losing the preglottalized stops. But that doesn't mean that all the other languages group together. Uh, but subsequently, uh, I have found, together with Gong Shun, who was working as a postdoc at, uh, uh, in London, uh, what we're calling the chicken-mouse split, uh, because it affects the words chicken and mouse. So uh, Burmese and no chong, the word for chicken goes back to grak, uh, but in Laovo and, and Pella, it goes back to something like arak, without any evidence of the G. And uh, mouse is very similar, where it goes back to grok in, um, in Burmese and Nochang, but goes back to rok in uh, Laovo and Pella. So you immediately say, wait a second. Are you saying that Proto-Burmish had two similar words for chicken, one grok and one rak? because that's exactly the kind of thing you were criticizing uh, in terms of what Dominic Yu was doing. And I would say, uh, no, that's not what we're saying. We, we probably would just reconstruct, if you like, a different initial here, like uh, a, a schwa after the G and say that Proto-Burmish had gurak and that, uh, and that the Maruic languages just dropped minor syllables at the beginning of words. Uh, whereas uh, in Burmish, in Burmic languages, apocope meant that you just delete the schwa and then you have a proper cluster. Something along those lines is what we would propose, uh, but we haven't published this yet, so I don't know. So if you have a bright idea, you can tell me. Uh, in any case, the point is it shows that Maruic has innovated together. Yeah, both Pella and Lauvo have treated these words in the same way. And that means Maruic is also a subbranch. And at the beginning when I was saying, you know, that I was skeptical of, of um, all these nice tree diagrams, it's because I think we need really for each uh, spot in a tree diagram uh, an explanation like 
of these, where you say these languages all share some innovation that's indicative of, of that place in the tree. And generally speaking, we don't have them. So, um, uh, which is why I haven't been giving them. <laughs> but also it's a way of uh, shortening the presentation. So now uh, about uh, Pun, I just want to mention this one particular language, which is dead, unfortunately. It was worked on in the 1980s, and then there were, there were in, in 2007 when U Tung Aung Cha looked at it, no one spoke it anymore. No one could really say anything except that they knew some words from, you know, oh, my grandmother used to use this word. Uh, but it's a really interesting looking language because it has these ta and ka prefixes of the type that you've been seeing in 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 pu and and mru, uh, but here in a oh no my Burmese script didn't turn out that's annoying. Uh, uh, as yeah, uh, so you don't get these prefixes in other Burmish languages. But just uh, take a look at some words. You have kali wind versus le in Burmese, kashai wood versus uh, sak, sach or something like that in Burmese, tami uh, fire versus uh, mi fire, tapa for frog versus pa, uh, and it doesn't seem predictable whether it's the ka or the ta. Uh, so I think this is very archaic. Similar things happening in in Gyaronic languages, and is is an area that I think uh, again uh, progress could really be made in terms of these ka and ta prefixes. So then, looking at Burmese, and Burmese came up in my 2019 book, so uh, you can look there for more details. Uh, tested first in uh, 1113, lots of stone inscriptions, uh, basically of kings giving land to monasteries. And there are a bunch of Burmese dialects, uh, and I just think it's important that we keep in mind that, uh, you know, that it's not like, oh, there's Burmese, the national language of Burma, but uh, that the national language of Burma is only one of uh, these types of Burmese that are quite different from each other. And finally, we're looking at Laloish, which is where honey uh, is. Uh, this is Laloish, and Laloish is, uh, how can I say, one of the, the good spreaders. It reminds me of like the Bantu languages in Africa. It, it's a, it's a, it's a sub-branch that has really spread very broadly and has lots of different members. Uh, so here is a, a, a Stammbaum. I won't talk you through all of it, but basically, and this is based on Bradley, we have northern, central, southern, and southeastern. Uh, but uh, Gerner says the classification of the Lolosh languages must be reexamined in the future by considering more data sets and also grammatical features, which is, so basically this is, you know, that Stammbaum is what Bradley, you know, wrote on the back of the envelope. Uh, needs more work. And I also think it's important to emphasize, uh, I've managed to avoid so far, the classification of people according to official PRC ideology, uh, but the mismatch between languages and uh, so-called so nationalities is at its worst with the Loloish languages, with uh, the particular absurdity that speakers of Kadzu are uh, classified as Mongolians. And my understanding of how this happened is, is, is they sent, so, so they sent ethnographers out into the field in the 1950s to find how many peoples were in China. And they first just asked people for their autonyms and came back and said, oh, you know, there's about 300, 400 ethnicities. And the government said, that's too many. Let's get it down to like 50 or something like that. And then, um, so they, they, they tried, and the Kadzu basically had the choice of being Yi or, or not, and they didn't want to be Yi, so they said, well, what else do you have on that list? And, and they have some kind of legend about uh, one of their chieftains being descended from the Mongols, so they said, okay, we're Mongolians. But now that means that you know, in PRC official statistics, they're Mongolians, which is ridiculous. Anyhow, uh, speakers of Hani, Lahu, Lisu, and Jino have their own uh, nationality. So that's to say, in the official Chinese list of nationalities, there are Hani, there are Lahu, there are Lisu, and there are Jino. Uh, but other uh, speakers of Laloish languages are generally grouped under uh, the category Yi, regardless of, 
of, of, of how close their particular language is or not uh, to each other. And uh, the, the, the sort of official Yi language is Nosu, uh, which also has its own script. Yeah, so, uh, and there are a number of, lang of, of languages, low lowish languages that are called Yi in China that used to use a logographic family of scripts. And I'm speaking in that way in terms of family of scripts because it's not like there is a classical Yi language. There are different low lowish languages that use different syllabaries. Uh, it's all quite messy and not very well researched um, uh, uh, and was never used for widespread administration or education in the way that like Tibetan or, or Uyghur were, but predominantly for religious texts and, and kept within families. So uh, now just looking at the branches altogether, in, in, in Northern Loloish, the big language is, is Nosu. In Central Loloish, you have Lahu, Lisu. And in Southern Loloish, Hani and Aka, uh, and these are just to give you, you know, a sense of the names of investigators who've worked on these. And then particularly uh, for Hani and Akka, there's this um, book series that I just got my hands on recently uh, that goes county by county and looks at uh, vocabulary mostly but, uh, of uh, Hani and Akka varieties in the PRC. And then Bisoid uh has uh the the bisu language which was discovered by uh nishi as the most prominent uh, member and then southeastern uh Loloish has fula uh, which there's a book about by pelki just as sort of if you like an observation maybe a criticism of work on Loloish is it's re there people who work on Loloish are really into comparative vocabulary lists and the languages can be quite similar. So you get these kind of uh, hundreds of pages of like, well, in this town, they pronounce this word this way, in this town, they pronounce it this way, where like uh, not a lot of discussion of, of, of grammar in a way that uh, would be um, maybe also useful. In terms of Loloish reconstructions, Bradley uh, reconstructed Proto-Loloish in 1979. It was out of date at the time of its publication, as pointed out by uh, Thurgood, the reconstructions failed to predict attested forms. Um, so I'm not particularly impressed by it. And I think that Tatsu Nishida has done some important work in uh, Loloish comparative reconstruction that hasn't gotten enough attention, mostly because he writes in Japanese. And I think that's generally true of Sino-Tibetan linguistics is that the contributions of the Japanese, especially let's say before 2000 were overlooked and have not been, uh, have, have, still have potential for having a good impact on the field. Uh, and then Jakob Dempsey in 2005 suggests a new approach to uh, the Loloish tonal split, uh, which I also think is very interesting and hasn't gotten much attention paid to it. It is worth mentioning that, that uh, James Matisoff is closely associated with the tonal, the Loloish tonal split. Uh, and that's seen by many as kind of he, one of his real um, uh, major contributions to Sino-Tibetan linguistics. I've never been able to make much sense of his book about it, so um, so can't really um, you know endorse it. I just I just don't. I'm not sure what he actually thinks, and uh, hope that one day uh, he or one of his students uh, states it in a way that's easier 